Hello all, old geek again, and in this video I will be revisiting the last AD&D rulebook that I bought back in the 1980s. Here's where I admit I didn't own every book, and there are some books I have never owned. This was the seventh AD&D rulebook I bought, The Dungeoneer's Survival Guide, and it was published in 1986. For those currently trying to work out which books I've owned, Originally I had the Player's Handbook, the Dungeon Master's Guide, an Earth Arcana, the Two Monster Manuals and the Fiend Folio, before getting this book. I stupidly got rid of almost everything in the early 2000s, and I've since re-bought most of them, and a few more. I've added Deities and Demigods, for example, a book that I didn't buy first time around, mainly because one of my friends had it, and he let me borrow his copy but I've never been tempted to rebuy the Dungeoneer's Survival Guide. So, why is this? Well, I was about 15 when I bought it originally. In fact, I got it as soon as I was aware it existed. After all, the game was played in dungeons, and the cover art was cool. So it had to be good, right? I devoured its contents. I enthused about it to my friends. But my players were utterly unimpressed. We play the game to go into dungeons, kill monsters and take their treasure. And everything in this book to them was simply getting in the way of them doing that. So the book was put away. And even when I started playing again at university with guys who were no longer teenagers, the book never resurfaced. So let's take a look at what was in it and um, let's see if my players were right to respond how they did. As with An Earth Darkana, published a year earlier, the Dungeoneer's Survival Guide is split into two sections. The first half of the book being aimed at players, the second half of the book being aimed at DMs. Now that's not a division that has ever really made sense to me as how many players would avert their eyes from the DM's information. Of course, it was just a ploy designed to sell more books. To sell books to players and DM's. Increase the market size. The players section opens with general information about underground adventuring. Its denizens and various types of cave and rock formation. I quite like this because uh, I uh, am interested in geography, the natural world. So this is the sort of thing that made me interested in what was going to be in this book. It then goes on to um, discuss movement within the environment, with new tables for swimming and climbing. Particularly relevant here is the chance of climbing by non-thief characters. That's useful. We also have rules for tools ropes, grappling hooks, etc, crossing bridges and chasms, and updated falling damage. There are 11 pages of new rules regarding moving through caves. Hmm, okay, slight overkill in my opinion. But I liked it all back then. Next up are non-weapon proficiencies. More flavourful and situational skills that might help you flesh out your character. These had first appeared in Oriental Adventures, but as I didn't get that book, this was the first time that I saw them, and I originally liked the idea of them. However, now many years later, I prefer to ignore them, and I would rather use the Professions table from the Dungeon Master's Guide instead when ruling on other skills that a PC might have. And so the player section goes on. Combat in awkward locations, fresh air or musty air or poisonous air, cave-ins, waterways, mining, more tables. How is all this relevant to the players? It's not really, and that just feels like overkill, it feels like added tedium. I can see why my players 
on seeing all of this, were put off by the rest of the book. In fact, it's not until we get to page 56 that we get something meaty that we, and my players at the time, found uh, useful again. And that's new equipment, an array of tools. The uses for the tools, beasts of burden, expedition planning, intelligent uses of spells underground. But all of this is just crammed into six pages. Certainly the best six pages in this player section of the book. And that's a shame, because the player section is over 60 pages in length. And to have only six pages of that bit really be of use is certain to put teenagers off. But does the Dungeon Master section get any better? Well, in short, yes. Certainly looking at it now through the eyes of a more experienced old man. After a bit of useless guff, initially, we have an interesting chapter on underground races, their motives and their communities. This is followed by a significant chunk regarding a suggested region for campaign use, the Lands of Deep Earth. For a DM wishing to construct a campaign in the Underdark, this is good stuff. Bringing plenty of logical ideas to the table that are ripe for the plunder. I guess this is the bit that would most tempt me to buy a physical copy of the book again. But when I was in my mid-teens, I was too disorganised to build a meaningful, lasting, cohesive campaign. Plus, we simply didn't meet regularly enough. Limitations I've covered in other videos, mostly due to my friends who played the game being scattered all over a wide area and the logistics of us meeting up. So instead I use modules all the time. I adapted the modules, I changed bits of them and I reused some certain sections but for me it was almost always modules. And I read the DM section in the Dungeoneer's Survival Guide but I never put it to good use and my players didn't really pay any attention to this bit because it didn't interest them. The following 14 pages are excellent too. Constructive information regarding creating and running scenarios, campaign preparation tips, player interactions. There's some very obvious bits and pieces in there um, and there's nothing in there that's any real revelation to me now. But under different circumstances, this could have been very useful for little teenage me. If only those circumstances had been different. Next comes a section that I believe most people will remember this book for. Map making. More specifically, the art of creating isometric 3D maps. We'd first seen this impressive style demonstrated in the module I-6 Ravenloft, though it had also graced a number of other modules by the time the Dungeoneer Survival Guide appeared. Most people will remember Ravenloft though as the other modules that used this style were nowhere near as good. Often they were a case of nice maps, shame about the module. Again, this section would be useful to me nowadays, rather than me as a teen. The book concludes with a very welcome collection of all the new tables, so you could refer to them much more easily, should you so desire. But the thing is, after the initial excitement, we didn't want to refer to them. My group back then wanted to bash down doors, kill trolls and run off with the loot. They weren't interested in a fantasy caving expedition, or the intricacies of owning and operating a mine. And that's why the book, as a whole, failed for us. That immediate extra crunch in the players section was over the top, fiddly. It all felt, ultimately, like a pointless exercise. Most of the more useful stuff was buried in the DM section, but that needed a mature, organised DM to make use of it, and to plan adventures and campaigns in an underworld setting. 
I wasn't that DM when I bought this book. Therefore, for me, it was ultimately a waste of money. And on realising that fact, I went on to not buy the Wilderness Survival Guide and the Manual of the Plains, or either of Greyhawk or Dragonlance Adventures. It was pretty much the book that burned me out of buying any more AD&D, certainly first edition AD&D hardbacks. But ultimately, looking back, the book isn't as bad as I thought it was. Certainly, it's not a necessary purchase. Most experienced DMs are more than capable of running a cohesive underground game without using any of the rules presented here. They have the general level of game understanding required to make logical rulings instead. And that is my own current position, and why even after revisiting the artwork and the images of the contents pages and thus having my memories of those contents revived while making this video, I'm still in no hurry to acquire it. Maybe one day, just for the sake of completeness, 